It's Friday, October 21. In the headlines, Flow launches Jump Initiative. Schools in Zozo is targeted for behavioral interventions. Regionally, St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister calls for expansion in OECS outlook. And in sports, West Indies crashes out of T20 World Cup after losing to Ireland. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Beneficiaries of the Program of Advancement Through Health and Education, PATH, are set to benefit from Flow Jamaica's JUMP initiative. It is aimed at bridging the digital divide within three to five years through a comprehensive program that focuses on providing access, devices and digital skills. Vice President of Flow Jamaica Stephen Price says the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the extent of digital exclusion in Jamaica. Across the Caribbean, broadband penetration rates remain below 50%, really leading to digital exclusion and limited opportunities for many. Here in Jamaica, our penetration also continues to lag and resulting impact is a widening gap between those who have access to life-changing opportunities and those who don't. Most recently, the pandemic shone a light on the communities that remain unconnected and have difficulty participating in online working or work from home. JUMP is a program that will provide subsidized broadband service to qualifying low-income households across Jamaica. Digital inclusion is about ensuring that the benefits of digital technologies are available to everyone. The children who need connectivity for remote learning, university students to do their research and assignments, the ability for citizens to use telehealth, participate in e-commerce, tap into entrepreneurship opportunities, and to connect to social services. Flo has partnered with the government and non-government organizations to roll out the project. Minister of Science, Energy and Technology, Daryl Vaz, and Minister of Labor and Social Security, Carla Simuda, were in attendance to the launch this week. We are engaged in establishing systems that will make it much more accessible for persons to obtain the benefits that we are able to provide, and I say able to provide because we all wish that it would be more. But at this time, we have to be contained because, of course, there's not enough resources to give the kind of support that I know we'd all like to see people get. There is nothing that is going to bring Jamaica and put Jamaica on the road to prosperity without good public-private partnerships. <laughs> Government is there to facilitate, not to get involved in private business. We are there to do what we are elected to do to, for the people of Jamaica, to deal with all the infrastructure matters and all of those things. But in terms of the growth, we must facilitate private sector, and that is what you are seeing today in relation to this partnership. A six-month pilot phase of the project is expected to start within a month. The aim is to reach 15,000 households across the country identified through the PATH program. 16,000 students at 25 primary and high schools based in zones of special operations will be targeted for behavioral interventions. Education and Youth Minister Favel Williams made the announcement while addressing the ministry's semi-virtual launch of its Just Medsit at Woolmer's Boys School in Kingston this week. We have more in this report. The initiative forms part of the ministry's programmed interventions to curb violence in schools. So this year-long campaign seeks to reduce the incidence of violence in schools through a multifaceted approach. By improving the physical infrastructure, 
by teaching and incentivizing strategies for resolving conflict peacefully, by providing psychosocial support to students and parents, utilizing the creative arts to maximize whole school engagement throughout the campaign, introduction of character education programs in school. We want to promote a culture of pro-social behaviors among students. We want to expand the uniform groups in our schools and clubs and societies. And we want a national call to action for educators, parents, students, and the general public. Other initiatives being spearheaded by the ministry include activities for Anti-Gang Week, which will be observed in mid-November. These aim to sensitize stakeholders on how to identify gangs in schools and will be the primary focus during the week. And we have expectations in terms of the number or the reduction in the incidence of violence in schools. Uh, we have benchmarks that will be developed so that we know if we're making progress. We will monitor and evaluate as we go along. The Ministry will also be partnering with the Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ, in its campaign to end violence in schools. The campaign is also a national call to action for every single Jamaican and organization to support our efforts to engender and sustain a culture of discipline and peace in our homes, our schools, and communities. Additionally, the United Nations Regional Center for Peace, Disarmament, and Development will convene a roundtable talks about gangs later this month. Reporting for PBCJ News, I'm Denita Rodney. Young persons are being encouraged to embrace music that encourages positive values. Those words of encouragement from Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, Desmond McKenzie. His call follows the recent ban imposed by the Broadcasting Commission on content that lauds illegal practices such as scamming, gun violence, drug abuse and more. What are the values that you're trying to instill? In, in, in the country, we, we can't be glorifying the kind of lyrics that's, that speaks to, to a lot of what is happening. We can't, we can't be glorifying. We, what we need to do is to encourage persons and those persons who have the ability to write the negative lyrics also have the ability to write positive lyrics. So, you know, so we, 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 we have to take a stand as a country. We can no longer hide under the cloak about freedom of expression. No one is denying anyone any expression. You know, what, what the Broadcasting Commission is saying, that in the public domain, you know, they, they have to control that on, on, on public radio, public media. The new rules cover TV and radio, including music, and list specific topics that are off limits. Scamming, drug abuse, and illegal use of firearms cannot be promoted, and swearing or near sounding replacements are also banned. Roshane Barnett has been given five concurrent life sentences for the murders of his cousin and her four children in Cocoa Peace, Clarendon, in June. Justice Leighton Pusey handed down his sentence in the Home Circuit Court on Thursday. Barnett, on July 28, pleaded guilty to the murder of 31-year-old Kamisha Wright and her children, 15-year-old Kimanda Smith, 12-year-old Sharalee Smith, 5-year-old Rafaela Smith, and 23-month-old Kishon Henry. In outlining the sentence, Justice Pusey considered the aggravating factors including that the family was murdered in their own home, where they would have considered themselves safe, that there was a breach of trust as the accused had been welcomed into their home. The multiple wounds on each of the deceased, which displays a direct viciousness by the accused in carrying out the attack, and that the attack was contemplated ahead of time, as Barnett had told someone, quote, he was going to kill some people, end quote, and indicated in his caution statement that, quote, Miss Wright was looking at him in a way, and so therefore he acted, end quote. Justice Pusey said he also took into consideration Barnett's lack of remorse, which was commented on by the forensic psychiatrist as well as a social worker 
who interviewed him. The St. Richard's Primary School, located in St. Andrew, held its annual Heritage Day celebration under the theme Reigniting Greatness Through Our Heritage recently. Here are the highlights. After a three-year hiatus, we have come back full force with the community supporting us as usual. Part of our thing here at St. Richard's is that the Jamaica Constabulary Force Band has always been providing us with excellent entertainment every year. And today is no different. And so we have parents coming out, bringing food, they purchase the food and they take it here and they buy it back. Because it's a community-based event that parents have always been supporting. We have the children performing a number of old-time um, heritage songs and you know this Heritage Day celebration really tie into our curriculum because as it is right now we are looking at promoting and preserving our cultural heritage. <laughs> Coming up in the business report, big news from Digicel. We have the details of that story plus other market updates from our reporter, Danita Rodney. Mobile network provider Digicel says they are prepared to support Ethan enabled devices beginning December 2022. The announcement comes on the second anniversary since Digital stepped out as Jamaica's digital operator on October 20, 2020 and gives customers more time to plan their purchases in order to enjoy a full-fledged digital experience. An eSIM is a digital version of the physical SIM card that customers now use to connect via smartphones, tablets, and other IoT devices. For your market updates, in foreign exchange trading for Thursday, October 20, the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $153.70. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $116.78. The pound sterling traded for $172.12. And the U.S. sold for an average of $152.86. In GSE trading, the GSE index advanced by 850 points. The Gina Market Index declined by 34 points. The Combined Market Index advanced by 483 points. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 714 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 104 stocks of which 44 advanced, 41 declined, and 19 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 1834 Investments Limited and AMG Packaging and the Paper Company Limited. Stocks declined for Access Financial Services Limited, Barista Investments Limited, and Bridger Pains Jamaica Limited. Trading firm were Careers Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share, and Epi 7.50% Preference Shares due 2024. The overall volume leaders were Lasco Manufacturing Limited with over 2 million units, Caribbean Cement Company Limited, and Dollar Financial Services Limited with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Eco Investment Fund was a volume leader with over 11,000 shares, followed by Calypso Macro Index Fund with 70 shares being traded. Zero securities were traded on the Barbados Stock Exchange. In regional business in Trinidad and Tobago, an economist is warning the country that poverty levels are rising and businesses are still struggling. Economist Dr. Val Mickey Arjun says Trinidad and Tobago is still reeling from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. During his speech at the Diwali Nagar on Tuesday evening, the economist says there were still social and economic fallouts being experienced in the country. Many businesses have not yet recovered some sectors are still very stagnant. And apart from that, we are also severely plagued by many criminal elements in our country, and poverty levels are on the rise. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is the darkness that we are faced with. The average global cost of living has risen more in the 18 months since the start of 2021 than it did during the preceding five years combined. What is causing the surge in prices? Find out more in the IMF's Charts in Motion.
In market data for oil, oil prices rose as hopes of stronger Chinese demand and the output cuts offset concerned about a global economic downturn and the impact of interest rate rises on fuel use. Brent crude was up $1 at $93.38 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate crude gained $1.14 to $85.65. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Denise. In regional news, we start in Belize. On Thursday, the Ministry of Blue Economy launched the Belize Sustainable Ocean Plan, titled the Belize Marine Spatial Plan. News 5's Dwayne Moody tells us more. Thank you. Thank you. Government and non-governmental organizations today witnessed the launch of the Belize Marine Spatial Plan, which is a framework under the Blue Bonds Agreement that seeks to pull together all stakeholders involved in the marine sector. It is not limited to the fisheries sector, but also the tourism industry and all those who have been and continue to benefit from Belize's waters. But the goal is to establish the Belize Sustainable Oceans Plan. When you look at sectors like the fisheries sector, which continues to contribute meaningfully to our national economy, we have to ensure that those systems that support a vibrant fisheries sector are healthy and they're productive. Tourism, our number one foreign exchange income earner, 41% it said of all tourists who come to Belize engage in some sort of marine activities. We are a natural capital base economy. And so what the Belize Sustainable Ocean Plan will now do, it represents a forward movement in us rationalizing how we approach the resources within our blue space. It is about protection of biodiversity. So there is ecological objectives in there, but there's also social objectives and econo economic objectives. So it's really about how do we best design our ocean space meet all these multiple objectives to ensure that while we are maintaining our natural resources, we are developing it in a sustainable way that will enable for, uh, yeah, for a prosperous country going forward. It's a five-year process in which the data collected will establish a comprehensive picture of what's happening within Belize's waters and will, in the end, be used to determine the guidelines for the do's and don'ts in national marine spaces. In St. Kitts and Nevis, Prime Minister Terence Drew believes it is time to expand the scope of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS's movement. He was speaking at the 72nd meeting of the OECS Authority this week. Prime Minister Drew said he was encouraged by the tremendous work done by the OECS Commission and the member states of the OECS on the revised Treaty of Bastyr. He also spoke of the possibility of forging close economic ties with African countries. Decisions to be taken at the very meeting of the authority on the portability of social security benefits, contingent rights policy implementation, capacity building for officials, and the finalization of an OECS unique identification card are steps in the right direction. I am convinced that we should build on this foundation and spread our diplomatic footprint on the African continent and further afield. We may wish to engage the African Union as they consider us the sixth region of Africa by, of course, considering observer status, giving us a seat at the table where matters related to trade, investment, and cultural cooperation are discussed. We may also wish to deepen our level of engagement by establishing a presence in major cities like Abuja, in Nigeria, Accra, in Ghana, and Cape Town, South Africa. The possibilities are endless. We have started the discussions with the Afrexim Bank, which was alluded to earlier by one of my colleagues, and I urge us to take the subject of joint representation to a higher level and make the necessary decisions to enable us to reap the rewards to be derived from this increased level of engagement. 
Meanwhile, Dr. Drew called for greater attention to intra-regional transportation because of its influence on investment, trade and the movement of OECS nationals and visitors to the sub-region. In Antigua and Barbuda, law enforcers can now easily access counseling services now that a mental health specialist is attached to the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda. Chief of Staff in the Prime Minister's Office, Ambassador Lionel Hurst, says the specialists will provide exclusive service to the law enforcers. The counseling psychologists that are assigned to the police uh, are only for the, uh, the police. As you know, uh, more than 700 men and women make up the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda, uh, and some of their duties can be really very taxing. Remember, they too have families, they have wives and children and husbands uh, in some instances. He says four school counselors will provide similar services at educational institutions. And their duties will primarily be focused upon uh, teachers to assist teachers in what has been a rather difficult period. And coming out of COVID, uh, we know that, um, that many, many teachers, in fact, uh, appeal for the kind of uh, services that uh, these uh, counselors will offer. And so the government has gone out of its way uh, to bring on board uh, these uh, four councillors that will be assigned to the four regions or the four zones into which education is divided. Responding to a reporter's question, Ambassador Hurst says the government could provide similar services to prison officers later. Technicians came in. Uh, they told us that it was fixed. And uh, we relied upon their word, and it turned out that it didn't get as cold as it should have. And as a consequence, um, there was some disruption in the way uh, the, the morgue normally functions. And so uh, several of the cadavers have been taken to uh, funeral homes, and uh, uh, I believe five of them have not been claimed uh, by persons, and they're ready for burial. So the government will move forward with burials. In international news, live entertainment is returning to bars and restaurants in Hong Kong as the government relaxes some of its strict COVID-19 measures. Protocol at theme parks and nightclubs would also ease as the territory battles to save its embattled economy. In Hong Kong, preparations are underway to wake up the territory's nightlife. After a hiatus due to COVID-19 measures, live entertainment will return to bars and restaurants. Finally. My band is happy, me itself as a musician, that finally we get back. I know it's long overdue. Under the new restrictions, performers will be required to complete two PCR tests a week and rapid tests before entering venues. The government hopes to allow citizens to resume their normal lives with their infection risk under control. Groups of up to 12 are now permitted and dancing at clubs is also allowed. The government hopes these changes will help boost Hong Kong's struggling economy. A lot of the sectors that we very much rely on uh, for boosting our growth, such as tourism, uh, for example, exports, are really in the doldrums uh, because of the COVID restrictions. Bar owner John Primer says his business took a hit during Hong Kong's strict COVID-19 measures and had to suspend operations. Still, he says he's optimistic. Yeah, I, I think the music scene's going to come back very strong. And a lot of guys during COVID, a lot of the guys wrote music and have recorded it. So they've got a lot of new stuff they want to showcase. Hong Kong's theme parks, once a popular attraction for domestic and international visitors, are also set to benefit from the policy change. The new protocol will allow visitors to dine in at theme parks, and while it will take much more to rejuvenate Hong Kong's tourism and entertainment sectors, many say any relaxation in COVID rules will bring much needed relief. Ocean Park says it's preparing for more visitors to return. Hong Kong has more measures in place than most cities in Asia. There are no quarantine requirements, but mask mandates remain and travellers must do three PCR tests within a week of arriving. Experts say the health situation is under control, but there are other factors at play as Beijing pursues a strict zero COVID-19 strategy. Hong Kong government is, is more cautious uh, and of course they have to look after the interests for the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the central government. Uh, in, in mainland China as well. As more restrictions are eased, many say allowing a bit more fun might just be what Hong Kong's people and its economy needs. 
In sports, the second round of the inter-secondary schools, the Costa Cup competition gets underway on Friday with six first leg games. In the second round, the teams are ranked from first to 32nd based on points earned from their performances this year, as well as points carried over from last year in some cases. And on the pitch, Ireland scored a nine-wicket win over West Indies on Friday, knocking the two-time champions out of the T20 World Cup in the preliminary phase and earning the team a spot on the Super 12s. West Indies skipper Nicholas Peran said his team didn't make the most of the ideal conditions after winning the toss and batting. The West Indies are the only team to win the World T20 title twice. Defending champions Australia will be aiming to amend that statistic and start the Super 12 stage against New Zealand on Saturday. Former champion Sri Lanka and Netherlands finished first and second in Group A to advance to the Super 12 round where they'll join the top eight ranked teams. FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 is set to kick off in 30 days. The opening ceremony will take place on November 20 in the capital of Doha and approximately 1.2 million fans are expected to visit the country during the tournament. For some, the World Cup party has already started. This group of Ghana fans live and work in Qatar. They'll get to see their team play in a country they've helped to transform. I feel part of the World Cup because I took part in the preparation, so it's, I feel very proud. It's a proud moment for me as a Ghanaian living in Qatar. The head of world football has been underlining the message that this will be a World Cup for all. Everyone will be welcomed to the tournament, regardless of their origin, background, religion, gender, sexual orientation or nationality. Qatar's capital Doha is being readied for the arrival of more than a million football fans. Well, behind me here, you can make out the FIFA Fan Festival. That's where up to 40,000 supporters can watch matches on big screens. And then in this direction, the main road along the seafront will be closed to traffic from November the 1st, making way 70,000 people at any one time. All eight stadiums are less than 40 kilometers away from the center of Doha. Never before will so many World Cup fans be in such close proximity. What is the logistical challenge of making sure fans on match days are safely and swiftly moved around the country? You mentioned the challenges of the compact nature. I think, again, it's, it's more the opportunity. With the transport network that we have uh, in Qatar, especially the public transport, um, you know, I used the metro going to many matches during the Arab Cup, for example, and it's incredibly uh, convenient. People come to the World Cup to have a great experience. They come to meet different people from different countries. So I think that it's organic, it's natural, it, it just happens. So you'll have, you know, uh, everybody from Saudi Arabia all the way down to Morocco, I think, mingling. Uh, and Qatar and Doha is a diverse city in and of itself. Qatar's national team have been in a six-month training camp ahead of their World Cup debut, a build-up designed to overcome the sporting odds. Statistically, uh, the chance of Qatar beating the Netherlands in a World Cup are very small. Hopefully, we can get a little bit of that togetherness that creates a mindset and a spirit and a collective belief that uh, the team is going to go out there and fight with everything they have. Qatar will kick the World Cup off against Ecuador at Al Bayt Stadium. The team and the country insist they're ready to put on a world-class performance. That's it for the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom-Gale. Pleasant viewing.